In this video, we're going to see how gravitational waves affect free particles. So we're finally going to see how gravitational waves, which are ripples in the curvature of space-time, cause the distances between free particles to expand and contract as the wave passes by. Just to review what we've covered so far, we started with the assumption of weak or linearized gravity where the metric g is equal to the flat metric eta plus a small change h. And defining h bar like this, we rewrote the Einstein field equations in linearized gravity like this. Then we introduced the Lorentz gauge, which is a family of coordinate systems that meet the condition where this derivative of h bar is zero. In the Lorentz gauge, the first three terms on the left side of the Einstein field equations go to zero. And if we take the case of a vacuum where the energy momentum tensor is zero, the Einstein field equations reduce to a wave equation for h bar. So gravitational waves are small deviations away from flat spacetime that travel at the speed of light c. Then we introduced the transverse traceless gauge coordinate system, where there are only two independent components of the metric perturbation h bar which are the plus and cross polarizations of gravitational waves. In this coordinate system, h and h bar are equal since their trace goes to zero. So now it's finally time to see how these plus and cross polarized gravitational waves affect free particles as they pass by. But there's one issue I want to bring up first. We found that in linearized gravity, the h-bar components satisfy the wave equation in the vacuum. And in the transverse traceless gauge, this reduces to the ordinary h-components satisfying the wave equation. But we know that in relativity, coordinate systems are arbitrary and don't play any role impacting physics. So it's worth asking, what if this wave equation is just the result of wavy lines in the coordinate system and not about real physical waves at all? With real gravitational waves, we'd expect the world lines of two nearby free particles to wave back and forth, as space stretches and compresses due to the gravitational wave. But it could be possible that this wave equation actually just describes wavy lines in the coordinate system. We can tell the difference between real gravitational waves and wavy coordinates. Recall that geodesic world lines, described by this equation here, are the paths that free particles take through space-time when no forces are acting on them. The shape of geodesics is only affected by gravity, which is the curvature of space-time itself, not a four-force vector that's pulling on the particle. And geodesics don't depend on coordinate systems. Also recall that the proper length L0 measures the distance between two space-like separated points at some constant time by integrating tangent vectors over the curve between the two points. And the proper length quantity also doesn't depend on coordinates. The final result is the same no matter which coordinate system we use. So using geodesics, which are the coordinate independent paths of free particles, and proper distance, which is a coordinate independent way of measuring lengths in space, we can measure how gravitational waves stretch and compress space in a coordinate independent way. So let's start by calculating geodesics of free particles experiencing gravitational waves. We're going to focus on massive particles. So we can use the proper time tau as our path parameter along geodesic curves. Also, since the four-velocity vector u of a particle can be written as the particle's tangent vector d by d tau, we can rewrite the derivatives dx by d tau as the u components of the four-velocity to make the geodesic equation look simpler. What we need now is to calculate the connection coefficients. If you recall from Relativity 109b, we calculated a formula for the connection coefficients in linearized gravity, which uses the inverse flat metric eta here and the derivatives of the h perturbation here. As usual, geodesic world lines come from the solutions to the geodesic equation. Now, given this formula, 
And knowing that the H components are plane waves in the plus and cross polarizations, even though many of these H components are zero, there are still lots of connection coefficients to calculate, and the geodesic equation can get pretty complicated. But there's one set of solutions to the geodesic equation that's easy to verify. Let's look at world lines whose four velocity vectors point completely in the direction of the time coordinate. So for the four velocity, the time component is C, and the spatial components are all zero. This is basically a world line that's at rest with respect to the coordinates in space, in the sense that the spatial coordinates are constant and it's just moving through time. So for these two summations over mu and nu, only the terms with time indices survive. And since ut equals c, this becomes c squared. So we can take our geodesic equation, divide by c, and move the connection coefficients to the other side. And using our formula for the connection coefficients, we see that all these h terms have at least one t index. And we know in our transverse traceless gauge, all the h components involving t go to zero. So everything on the right hand side goes to zero. Also, this derivative of the u components also goes to zero, since all the u components are constant and their derivative must be zero. So we get that zero equals zero, which means that our original guess of a world line with constant spatial coordinates is a valid geodesic. So we know this four velocity vector describes geodesics. And since the u components are just the derivatives of the four spacetime components, we can take the antiderivative to get the full world line formula, which gives the spacetime components parameterized as a function of the proper time tau for the particle traveling along the world line. This geodesic is basically a starting point B that remains at constant space coordinates and travels forward in the time direction at a rate of c. At first glance, it might seem like these geodesics imply no waves in space-time are happening, because the geodesics have constant space coordinates. But remember, in relativity, we can never trust our eyes to measure distances on space-time diagrams. It could very well be the case that the proper distance between these two geodesics is changing. It turns out this is exactly what's happening. Here's another way of visualizing the exact same situation. In the transverse traceless gauge, the spatial coordinate lines are sort of waving along with space-time as the gravitational wave passes by. And the distance between neighboring geodesics is actually changing. And we can check this by calculating the proper distance L0 between two neighboring geodesics. If you recall from the last video on the transverse traceless gauge, we derived gravitational plane waves that were traveling completely in the z direction, described by this wave vector. The resulting two wave amplitudes A plus and A cross only impact the metric in the x and y directions. So to understand these gravitational waves, let's look at a space-time diagram for how the xy plane changes over time. We'll start with a geodesic at the origin. Remember, our geodesics have constant position coordinates. So this geodesic remains on the time coordinate curve attached to the origin for all time. Next, let's take a nearby point given by this displacement vector v. We can also look at the geodesic at this point, which also has constant position coordinates. We can then ask how the proper length L0 of this vector changes over time. The technically correct way to approach this question is to treat the vector v as a curve parameterized by a path parameter lambda. Then get the curve's length by integrating over the curve's tangent vectors d by d lambda. The magnitude of d by d lambda is given by the square root of negative d by d lambda dotted with itself, where we use a negative sign because this is a space-like curve. Our curve can just go from lambda equals 0 to lambda equals 1, with the x and y coordinates being proportional to the x and y components of the vector v.
If we churn through the math, the result ends up just being the magnitude of the vector v with no integral required. So all we need to do to get the proper distance between these two geodesics is to calculate the dot product of v with itself. So we can expand the vector v as a linear combination of basis vectors, and the dot product of the basis vectors becomes the metric tensor components g. Normally, this sum would be over all four spacetime components, but since we know the displacement vector is only in the xy plane, we'll only sum over x and y. And since we know the metric tensor is symmetric, gxy and gyx are the same, so we can combine these into two times the same term. Now remember, for each of these three terms, the g metric is the flat metric eta plus the metric perturbation h, given here. Now, in our flat metric sign convention, the xx and yy components of the flat Minkowski metric are negative 1, and the off-diagonal elements like xy are 0. The h terms come from our plane waves multiplied by the amplitude matrix, with the amplitudes of the plus and cross polarizations. hxx gives us the a plus amplitude, hxy gives us the a cross amplitude, and hyy gives us the negative a plus amplitude. And all of these are multiplied by plane waves. So looking at all these terms, we can group them into the two constant terms and the three perturbation terms that are multiplied by the plane wave. We can also group the two a plus terms together by factoring out a plus. So the first part of this result for measuring the squared length of the vector is the standard result from the flat Minkowski metric, and it has a negative sign because the displacement vector v is a space-like vector. The rest of the terms are the changes in the metric due to gravitational waves. So we can see here that the distance between the two neighboring geodesics is in fact changing due to vibrations in the h part of the metric. Even though the geodesics have constant space coordinates in the transverse traceless gauge. To understand the effect of these waves, I'm going to look at the changes in geometry due to this second part of the metric, involving plane waves, which I'll call delta for short. Let's see how the metric changes when the two geodesics are separated by a displacement vector in the x direction. So all the vy components in our formula go to zero. We're left with a plane wave multiplied by the a plus polarization amplitude. What about if the displacement vector is in the y direction? We set the vx components to zero and get the same wave with the a plus polarization amplitude, but with a negative sign in front. Since we can rewrite negative 1 as e to the i times pi, this is the same a plus wave as above, but shifted by half a cycle. So the vibrations in the x and y directions happen together, but they are out of phase by half a cycle. Now, what if the displacement is in a diagonal direction, where the vx and vy components are either both positive or both negative? For a perfectly diagonal direction, the magnitudes of vx and vy are the same, so vx squared minus vy squared goes to zero. And since vx and vy have the same sign, the sign of their product is always positive. And our result only contains the a cross amplitude, not the a plus amplitude. Now what if we have a diagonal direction where vx and vy have opposite sign? Again, vx and vy have the same magnitude. So vx squared minus vy squared goes to zero. But now, since vx and vy have opposite sign, the result of their product is negative. Which again means we get the same a cross wave as above, but shifted by half a cycle. So note that if the displacement is only in the x or y direction, only the a plus part of the wave impacts the proper distance, and the a cross part of the wave plays no role in the spatial distance at all.
And since the x and y directions have wave amplitudes that are out of phase by half a cycle, when the x direction has its distance increased by the metric, the y direction has its distance decreased by the metric. And the reverse is true half of a wave cycle later, where x decreases and y increases. And if our displacement is in a diagonal direction, then only the a cross part of the wave impacts the proper distance, and the a plus part of the wave plays no role in the distance. And the two perpendicular diagonal directions have opposite phase, so that when one direction has its distance increased by the metric, the perpendicular direction's distance is decreased. And again, half a cycle later, the perpendicular directions swap, so that when one decreases, the other increases. So I've showed these animations of plus and cross polarized gravitational waves before. And while the spirit of this animation is true, these animations are geometrically inaccurate. A plus polarized wave will leave the diagonal points on a circle completely unchanged. Because for a diagonal displacement, only the A cross part of the wave influences it. And conversely, a cross polarized wave will leave the horizontal and vertical points on a circle completely unchanged. Because for the horizontal and vertical directions, the points are only impacted by the A plus part of the wave, not the A cross part of the wave. Remember, in order to get the actual distances between points in a gravitational wave, we calculate the square root of this negative dot product. So the terms under the square root should include the flat Minkowski result, as well as the terms associated with the plus and cross polarized gravitational waves. So now we finally understand the mathematics behind the LIGO detector. If a gravitational wave passes through the Earth, it will alternate between extending one arm of the detector and shortening the other, and then vice versa. This causes a difference in the path lengths for light beams that travel along each arm, allowing the light beams to interfere with each other in such a way that they send a signal to the detector. So to summarize this video, we showed that gravitational plane waves cause actual stretching and squashing of physical space through a time-varying wave in the components of the metric perturbation H. We showed this by calculating the proper length between neighboring geodesics, and showing it changed over time and space. In linearized gravity, gravitational plane waves have two polarizations. The plus polarization maximally affects the x and y directions and does not impact diagonal directions. And the cross polarization maximally affects diagonal directions and doesn't impact the x and y directions. If you want more proof that gravitational waves are indeed changes in the curvature of spacetime, you can calculate the Riemann curvature tensor for a vacuum spacetime experiencing a gravitational wave, and show that the Riemann curvature tensor is non-zero. I've included links in the description if you want to go through the calculations.